We are back with another episode of Arcade Treasures. Here you will find a collection of games that really made an impression on me. Sometimes it was the graphics and sound, other times the gameplay or difficulty. Many of the 10 games I have chosen here never came home faithfully, and some of those likely never will due to license issues. These games are from industry juggernauts like Capcom, Namco, Atari, and Taito, some of the best and most prolific game makers of the 80s and 90s. This is going to be a good one, folks. Let's get started. In the summer of 1989, Capcom released a run-and-gun platformer for its CPS-1 arcade system based on the movie Willow. Like most of Capcom's arcade games at the time, it's loaded with great animations, color, and plays like a dream. You have the ability to play as the titled character Willow, as well as his warrior companion, both having very different attack types. The visuals here are incredible for a game made in the late 80s, particularly the amount of stuff on screen, the size of the balsas, and the sheer level of detail. It was a beautiful game for sure, and it even has some very decent music to go along with the action. Capcom brought the property to the NES as well, but it's an entirely different game. This particular version has never seen a home release of any kind, making MAME a necessity for the vast majority of you to actually play it. I highly recommend that you do, it's one of the very best licensed games of the era. In the summer of 1987, Capcom released Black Tiger, an action platformer with a ton of features you normally didn't see in this type of game. It has a store you can access by rescuing people in each stage, which grants you access to upgrades to your life, defense, attack power, and more. This elevates Black Tiger well above the typical fare you'd see back then, and heavily contributes to its replayability today. I always kind of saw this as Capcom's version of Rastan, and similar to the Taito classic, Black Tiger here is extremely challenging. There are dangers everywhere and many will spawn right on top of you. Believe it or not, the Japanese version of this is even harder. If you'd like to play this at home, you're in luck. It was released on a bunch of the micro PCs of the era, and has seen an inclusion in a few of Capcom's arcade compilations for systems like the PS2 and Xbox 360. It's not for those that anger easily, but save states can make it a bit more tolerable. Shockingly, this was all done on an 8-bit arcade system that was driven by the same type of CPU in Sega's Master System. Ever wondered what Sega's Gunblade New York would have looked like as a superscaler? Well, Namco actually answered that question well before you had it in early 1991 with Steel Gunner. This shooter puts you in pursuit of an evil terrorist group trying to destroy the world. While Sega may have been well known for its incredible superscalers, the Namco System 2 Plus here was no slouch. Just look how fast and efficient this game moves around sprites. It was definitely a looker in its day, and still holds up well now. Like most gun games, the gameplay is straightforward. Mow down everything trying to kill you across its four stages. It's very much in the same vein as traditional arcade shooters like Operation Wolf, just now with some grade-A scaling effects thrown in for good measure. You have missiles to clear the screen every so often, and there are of course boss fights here to rob you of your life precious. 
She's a winner, and there is even a sequel to it if you want more of the same. In 1996, Taito released another entry in the Bubble Bobble series called Bubble Memories. This third effort plays very similar to the other games, but now employs much larger characters, new power-ups, and a new super bubble attack for even more bonus points. The story here is simple. Twin brothers have been turned into bubble dragons and must now climb the rainbow tower to undo the spell. It's got 80 levels to contend with, so you'll need some serious skills to see the quest through. I always enjoyed the simple nature of these games and the two-player co-op it employs. The visuals and sound are as chipper as ever, and the increase in character size from time to time adds a cool new dynamic to the mix. This version came home in the PS2 game Taito Memories 2 Volume 1 Arcade Perfect, and of course you also can access it thanks to MAME. If you need a go-to game to play with your kids, this is definitely high on the list of recommendations. Namco also did the 1989 air bike shooter Burning Force. This one I didn't discover actually had an arcade variant until years after I played the Sega Genesis port, so I was quite curious to see how it fared. Sure enough, it's Namco Gold, taking a ton of cues from games like Space Harrier. You get two forms of gameplay here. One is on your air bike where you can move left to right and gain power-ups, while you take down enemies coming at you similar to other superscalar type games. You then get powered up and can move anywhere on the screen you want, granting you far more mobility and killing power. I always love the scrolling effect of the water and ground here. It's done on the same hardware as Steel Gunner, Namco System 2, and it's a great looking game overall. It kind of puts you in mind of what a Panzer Dragoon game may have looked like if it was a superscalar. Namco also nailed the music here, stuff that is worth listening to outside the game. The Genesis version is decent, but the arcade is where this one truly shines. Capcom released some damn fine beat-em-ups in the arcade, but the CPS-powered Cadillacs and Dinosaurs is perhaps one of their very best. Based on the comic and animated series, the crazy story has you battling poachers and dinosaurs in the future. You get to choose from four playable characters with there being co-op for up to three of them simultaneously. Like many of Capcom's beat-em-ups before it, you can punch, kick, grab, throw, and dash attack until your heart's content. You also get weapons like knives and guns to aid you in your quest. This one very much reminds me of the Punisher in many ways, so if you enjoyed that, you just gotta play this. The animation and detail in the visuals is typical Capcom excellence, and I even enjoyed the music here. It's much more dynamic than Capcom's earlier work, 
and there tends to be much more happening on screen at once. The license of course prevents this from an easy revival today, but luckily MAME is here to the rescue. Every beat em up fan should have access to this great game. Unlike many of you, I was not a big fan of Atari's arcade games. What many people remember fondly, I simply remember as being substandard next to the stuff Namco and Sega were doing at the same time. I have to give props where it's due, however, because I absolutely loved Road Riot 4-Wheel Drive. It's done Super Scaler style with a great 3D feel to it. Basically, you are running races with your Dune buggy that is capable of shooting other contestants to slow them down. The visuals were great for a 1991 release, and I really dug the off-road environments that often played differently depending on the surface. It saw a few home ports to systems like the Super Nintendo and Atari Lynx, but the arcade version is, of course, the vastly superior version. It supports two players, encourages crashing into things, and is a hell of a good time. In 1991, Irem released the much underappreciated Lethal Thunder. This vertically scrolling shoot 'em up very much puts you in mind of a mix of games like Truxton and Raiden. Your ship comes equipped with a power up system based on how rapidly you press the fire button. Once charged up, you keep it there with continued rapid fire and have the ability to launch your charged option as a power attack. This resets your power level and must be charged again. Various weapon types appear as you play, often with new stages giving you a completely different weapon. I really enjoyed the gameplay system here, and while it doesn't win any awards for its visuals, it's still a solid looking game. I also love the music, as it has that hard edge sound that many games on the Genesis are known for. It doesn't have an accurate home version that I know of, which is likely the reason so few people actually know it exists. If you are a fellow lover of shoot 'em ups though, this is an arcade treasure for sure. Ever wanted to see a property like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles but with cows? Well that's exactly what Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa was. Mutated cows are out to keep the peace in this 1992 game that plays almost exactly like Sunset Riders. Konami is at the helm and as you'd expect, they did a fantastic job with this run and gun shoot 'em up hybrid. Much of the game sees you in side scrolling levels running and jumping while you blow away bad guys and you also get the odd stage that allows you to fly around and shoot like a traditional horizontal shoot 'em up. There is four player simultaneous co-op here and of course it all looks exceptional. The color and animation are up to the standards of other Konami games at the time and even perhaps a little bit better. Unfortunately it was attached to an animated series of the same name, meaning that it ever being re-released is about as probable as Sega doing anything significant with their classic arcade IPs. If you haven't played this weirdly wonderful game, MAME emulates it perfectly.
Too Crude, or Crude Buster, was a 1991 Data East beat-em-up that felt a bit similar to Bad Dudes. New York has been wrecked by a nuclear weapon, and your job is to go in and pacify the group responsible. The two-player co-op gameplay is heavily reliant on weapons that are often strewn all over the stage, including the ability to pick up and use enemies as bludgeons and projectiles. This here, my friends, is one of the most infuriating arcade games I've ever played. Enemies are merciless in their efforts to stop you, and it employs many cheap tactics to rob you of your precious health. I loved its gameplay, however. It was really challenging, sure, but it gave you so many items and so many ways to attack, you just had to appreciate it. It didn't have the refinement of some of the better beat-em-ups at the time, but what it lacked there, it more than made up for in variety. It's been brought home a few times, including a Sega Genesis port and in the compilation Data East Classics for the Nintendo Wii. No awards are won here for sound or visuals, but it is a challenging game with impressive variety. Even though we are on part 4 of the series, I still have countless other recommendations to go if you guys are still interested. The arcade is chock full of games with nearly endless replay value and fun, and even I discover new ones all the time. It was a vast and deep ocean of content for over 30 years, and I could go on and on forever with my favorites. As I do these episodes, I have also begun to notice a trend that the better games are often done by the same companies. Capcom, Konami, Namco, Taito, Irem, and Data East were often attached to the very best the arcade had to offer. Their level of quality was simply top tier, and time and time again they proved they were the best at what they did. I have a feeling that as this series goes on, we will be seeing much more from each of them. I'm SigaLordX, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.